I'd like to welcome everybody to the Pincher Creek Library's 2021 Winter Speaker Series. I'm very honored to get to introduce Gail Michener tonight. Um, Gail is our Professor Emerita at the University of Lethbridge devoted her professional career to understanding the behavior and ecology of Richardson's ground squirrels, commonly known as gophers. Her studies were, con were conducted on the grassland portion of her husband's pedigreed seed farm near Picture Butte where she especially focused on the sexual differences in longevity, social, sociality, <laughs> size, reproductive behavior, and timing of the active season. Okay, thanks very much, Sam. Thank you for introducing me and giving me an opportunity to talk about what is my favorite animal? And of course, you've already given away the fact that Richardson's ground squirrels go by another name. And that's where I want to start my talk because uh, we get into terminological confusion over just exactly what these animals are. So Richardson's ground squirrels. And so I'm basically channeling the great English bard saying, wherefore art thou a ground squirrel? Uh, and ans answering as Shakespeare did, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. And so what's the right way we should refer to these animals? I'm sure that many of you think of them immediately as gophers, and certainly they are culturally in our society as by that name. Uh, the Saskatchewan Rough Riders located in Regina have their mascot, uh, Gaina the gopher. And I'll just point out that Gaina is actually an anagram of Regina, very appropriate. So it tells you that they're from uh, Regina mascot. Big Rock Brewery for a number of years uh, made gopher lager, it no longer does, uh, but it had these advertising signs wrapped around stacks of bales out in the fields where the, the grain that went into the lager was made. So I'm well aware that many people will preferentially use the word gopher, but I want to talk a little bit about the fact that they really are squirrels and where this comes from. So you, I find if you ask somebody to define a squirrel or describe a squirrel, you know, how do you know something's a squirrel? I think almost always what's going to happen is the person's going to say, oh, well, it has a big bushy tail. And that's certainly appropriate for one like this. This is a red squirrel in, our, in the Rocky Mountains here, balancing on little twigs in a tree. And clearly it helps to have a lovely big bushy tail to balance the body. Strictly speaking, we should identify the arboreal squirrels, those that are in trees and need a, a bushy tail for balance. We should identify them as tree squirrels, but generally we just say squirrel. And if you just say squirrel, always it means squirrel that lives in trees, an arboreal one. The reality is that there are many more species of squirrels that live on the ground than there are squirrels that live in trees. And that's especially true of Alberta. Uh, we only have two species of tree dwelling squirrels in Alberta, the red squirrel that you see in the mountains, and then the nocturnal northern flying squirrel, which most people never get to see because they're only active at night. But we have 11 species of squirrels that live on the ground. So we have a very rich fauna of squirrels, but they happen to be ground dwelling squirrels. And so what are these ground dwelling squirrels? Well, it depends on their size. We give them different names. So these all live on the ground, so we call them ground dwelling squirrels. And according to their size, if they're fairly small and only weigh maybe 125, 150 grams, uh, we refer to them as chipmunks and they characteristically have this white stripe on the face. If they're a little bit bigger than that, uh, so maybe 250 to 500 grams, we refer to them as ground squirrels. If they're bigger again than that, maybe getting up into 750 grams to a kilo, they're prairie dogs. And the really, really big ones, the ones that weigh two or three kilos are marmots. And so we have representatives of most, but not all of these sizes of ground squirrels in Alberta. We have three species of chipmunks, all of them are in the mountains. We have three species of marmots, two of which are in the mountains, and then the woodchuck, which is uh, out in the parkland type areas. We have no prairie dogs, 
So keep that in mind, because I'll come back to that point. But we have five species of ground squirrel. So these intermediate sized ones we refer to as ground squirrel, but all of these are referred to as ground dwelling squirrels. So the terminology does get a little confusing sometimes here. So who are the ground squirrels of Alberta? Well, the four other than the Richardson's ground squirrel in the mountains, there's the Columbian. They're the ones that you see in the meadows. If you go to Waterton Lakes Provincial Park, uh, National Park, you see them around the picnic areas. Golden mantle ground squirrel also in the mountains, but not so much on the open meadows uh, as areas where there might be some rocky scree slopes uh, as well. So a more complex environment. If you go into the foothills and then up around into the parklands, you'll run across the 13 line ground squirrel. And then there is the Franklin's ground squirrel, which actually often looks more like a quotes regular squirrel because they have quite a long tail that they carry, but they are again another type of ground squirrel. And then there's the one that I've spent my life studying and that's the Richardson's ground squirrel. So that's the fifth of five species that we have in Alberta and that we call ground squirrels. Now I'm going to call them ground squirrels because, well, <clears throat> that's what they are. But, so why don't we call them gophers? So many people do, that's the everyday name that we hear for these animals. Well, it's because gopher actually refers to another group of mammals and so it gets a little confusing here and I'm trying to explain the differences between what goes on. So here's a book that lists the 4,600 species of mammals in the world. And if you go to the index and you look for the word gopher, you discover there isn't anything listed under gopher. They refer you instead to something called pocket gophers. And then if you go to the pocket gophers in the index, then you discover there's this huge list of uh, pocket gophers in North America. They're not found anywhere else, but in North America only one of them occurs in Alberta. So we do have a true gopher, and by true gophers, as a zoologist, I would say that's a type of pocket gopher. If you want to find the Richardson's ground squirrel, you've got to start looking under S for squirrels, and then the subcategory of squirrels that live on the ground. And there you'll find the Richardson's ground squirrel along with the Columbia and the Franklins, the Golden Mantle. Uh, the 13 line drops off the screen here, so you can't see it. So in a, in a, to a zoologist, all of these are types of squirrels and they're very different from gophers. So let's just compare the two because probably quite a few people uh, are familiar with gophers, but if, if so, they likely call them moles, just to add to the terminological confusion. So we have, uh, both of these animals are rodents. Here's a, a pocket gopher, so called because it has on in its cheeks a fur-lined pouch quite separate from the mouth that they can stuff goodies into like food items and so forth without putting them directly into the mouth. So that's the pocket of the pocket gopher. They're much smaller than the Richardson's ground squirrel, so they might get up to maybe 150 grams or so. So they're quite different in their appearance and their relationship to each other. And so if we look at some of the characteristics of Ground squirrels, they're obligate hibernators, so you don't see them at all in the winter because they're in hibernation. When they're active, they come aground, above ground to eat because they forage on vegetation. They do that in the daytime, so we refer to them as being diurnal. You can easily tell whether there's ground squirrels around because they have mounds, soil mounds, with a hole that goes into a tunnel and you can glance down into that. And as I've said, there's five species of these in Alberta. The go pocket gophers, on the other hand, do not hibernate. They forage below ground, they eat the roots of plants, so they don't need to come above ground to eat. They are a little more active at night than they are in the daytime, so we would refer to them as being nocturnal, but that barely matters because they spend most of their life underground. They do sometimes kick out soil if they've got to get rid of some soil in their system, and you'll see a mound above ground that has no hole in it. And you'll probably start seeing that as snow melts back, you'll uncover uh, mounds, mounds of soil that clearly have been dug up from below, but don't have any entrance, don't have any hold that goes in. Those are mounds that have been made by pocket gophers, the ones that live below ground. So they're really quite different animals, even though they're both types of rodents. Uh, and so we deal with a situation that the ones that zoologists would call ground squirrels 
get called gophers in a vernacular way, and the pocket gophers, which we do have one species of in Alberta, it gets called mole, but moles are a totally different sort of mammal. They're not even rodents. Uh, they're insectivores that eat things like beetles and earthworms and so forth. So it's always a trick keeping track of what we should call these animals. So to me, these are Richardson's ground squirrels. They're squirrels because of the characteristics they share with tree squirrels, which mostly have to do with dentition uh, and the cranium, so bony characteristics. Obviously, it's appropriate to call them ground squirrels because they really do live on the ground. And then amongst the ones we have in Alberta, we have one called Richardson's ground squirrel. So where does that name come from? Who is Richardson? And I like to ask that question of an audience. And maybe some people who are listening do know who the Richardson is. Uh, and he's a fairly important person in Canadian history. So it's appropriate for people to know who he is. As a British naval officer, John Richardson, he accompanied the first two Franklin expeditions to the Arctic. Uh, many of you probably are aware from the, the recent research that's been done on the third Franklin expedition where everybody, uh, everybody died and after they were stuck in sea ice for years. Fortunately for Richardson, he was not on the third expedition, so he lived actually quite a long life uh, and uh, was a very famous physician in his time. His job on these two Franklin expeditions was second in command to Franklin, and he was what British call a surgeon, in other words, a medical doctor. And what was common at that time was people who were medical doctors were often very good naturalists. They knew about the plants that could be used, for instance, uh, for medications, etc. And so Richardson was given a couple of duties. He was to help keep the, the sailors, uh, the men on the, the voyage healthy, but also to collect as much material as he could during the voyage, send it back to Britain so that it could be described in the British Museum and the knowledge spread around the world of what the new finds in North America were. So this was actually an overland expedition. So this seems a bit odd, isn't it? We've got a naval officer going on an overland expedition, but that fitted with what was known in the early 1800s. Parts of the coastline from the west and the east of the Arctic were known, and people were trying to push through and get further and further to see if there was a Northwest Passage. But of course, it was very difficult in those slow ocean going vessels. They would inevitably have to spend winters uh, in the Arctic and often with tragic consequences. So the Navy, the British Navy had the rather brilliant idea, I think, of, well, if we want to map some of this coastline here, instead of approaching it, on the ocean, why don't we approach, approach it over land? And so they sailed in 1819 into Hudson Bay and then portaged through a variety of river systems finally into the copper mine. Copper mine flows north to the coast. And so that was their opportunity to get to the coastline, map a little bit of coastline and then go all the way back. It was a three year uh, expedition, the first one from the, uh, Richardson was on. So it's really quite remarkable that Richardson's name ends up being associated with a ground squirrel because the Richardson's ground squirrel, of course, is a species that lives well inland and the likelihood that a naval officer would have encountered it is remarkable, but of course it was an overland expedition. And in May of 1820, after they'd overwintered the first winter, Richardson did some collections around here near Fort Carlton, which is now in what we call Saskatchewan. Uh, he packaged those specimens up, sent them back to Britain while he continued the rest of the expedition. And eventually those specimens reached the British Museum and the specimen was named then in Richardson's honor. So the scientific name, this was given by a, a scientist working in the British Museum uh, using the name Richardson in its Latinized form, Richardsonii, to name the squirrel. Richardson himself was, still hadn't even returned to England by the time the species was named in his honor in 1822. So that leads us to use Richardson then as the adjective that tells us which type of the five ground squirrels we've got in Alberta, which is this particular one, and so the Richardson's ground squirrel. But it has this vernacular name of generally being called gopher, or if people want to distinguish it from some of the other 
so-called gophers, and you call it the prairie gopher as opposed to the striped gopher or the gray gopher. But really, we should honor Richardson by referring to the species by its more formal name of Richardson's ground squirrel. And why not use both of them if you want to, but remember that they are truly ground squirrels and named after an important Arctic explorer. So does anyone else use the term ground squirrel? Is it just the scientists, the zoologists who use the term ground squirrel? Well, no, it turns out that in the pet trade, they are referred to as ground squirrels. And it may be a surprise to many people to know that Richardson's ground squirrels are considered exotic pets. And so I've searched several exotic pet uh, sites. In uh, 2019, this particular company located in Michigan was selling them for 150 US dollars a piece. Okay. So these are very valuable animals in the pet trade. Here's a Texas site that was selling them for 125 US dollars a piece. Now quite a few people have them as pets. They can make really, if you get them when they're young, they make really quite acceptable pets. And I know people who have them for, they don't live terribly long, but four or five years and are very attached to them. So there's a real contrast to the attitude that we get in a lot of the prairies where the only good gopher is a dead gopher. Here we have people paying real hard money to have a, a pet gopher. Or pet Richardson's ground squirrel, as I would call it. Now, we have to deal with the problem here, which is the advertising by the Pincher Creek Library said that I was going to talk about prairie dogs. And so now I have to add in one other complication to what's going on, which is prairie dogs, as you've seen, are a totally different species. I mentioned that we have none in Alberta. So we have Richardson's ground squirrels and black tail prairie dogs, one of five species of prairie dogs. And they do look quite similar, particularly if you get a fairly chunky fat Richardson's ground squirrel, it can look quite like a, a, a prairie dog. But there are a lot of things to look out for. The Richardson's ground squirrel have always, the, the tip of the tail is pale. There may be a few black hairs in the tail, whereas the black tail prairie dog has a very distinct black tip and black on the, the dorsal side as well. Also, the tail is quite short for the size of a prairie dog as compared to the tail on a ground squirrel. The ground squirrels are slimmer, more streamlined animals, particularly they have quite delicate faces compared with the heavier, chunkier face and chunkier body of the black-tailed prairie dog. So you can certainly train your eye to see the difference. Where they are is part of the story. I'd already said that there are no prairie dogs uh, in Alberta. The only place in Alberta, where, in Canada rather, where there are prairie dogs is Grasslands National Park. In fact, that's the main reason for the existence of that, that national park is because it's a small population of prairie dogs that is, crosses the border uh, and up into Saskatchewan. Uh, so in, a, in Canada, the only place to see prairie dogs is Saskatchewan Grasslands National Park but they are throughout the US states going down from, if you go down from North Dakota, Manitoba, uh, Montana, further south, right to the Mexican border, you'll find uh, black tailed prairie dogs all over the place. That of course contrasts where you would go to find Richardson's ground squirrels. They're in our three prairie provinces of Canada and the immediately adjacent Northern states like Montana and North Dakota. So there's not much, not all that much overlap in the geography of where you expect to find these things. So black tail prairie dog, no, that is not what I'm talking about. I'm really focusing on Richardson's ground squirrels. Another big difference between the two species is that Richardson's ground squirrels are obligate hibernators, and it's very rare for black tail prairie dogs to hibernate. In fact, Saskatchewan itself is the only place where usually they will spend a few weeks in hibernation, but that's all. They're really pretty active even through the winter time. So just to say it again, the animal that I'm studying is called the Richardson's ground squirrel, and that is what I generally refer to them as. What, we, what everybody knows about these animals is that they spend part of their life above ground, what we would refer to as the active season. And let it be said that today, I saw a couple of Richardson's ground squirrels out of hibernation. Most of them are still in hibernation, so they have a lengthy hibernation season. 
But at a certain point, and that's coming up right now, it's just beginning, uh, we start seeing animals coming above ground. And of course, during the time they're above ground, even in the active season, they only spend part of every day above ground. They still spend a lot of time uh, underground, sleeping, for instance, underground, and some other things that I'll mention as I go along, they do underground. So Sam had indicated in her introduction that I've been working uh, uh, in near uh, Picture Butte in southern Alberta. Um, my husband, who trained as a zoologist, that's how we actually met each other, decided to change careers after we married and become a farmer. And we bought property in uh, near Picture Butte. Uh, Dan became a pedigreed seed farmer, selling uh, seed to companies and to other farmers. And this was an irrigated farm. Uh, and you can see in the distance here, pivot irrigation. But there was this area here, a couple of hectares of land that couldn't be irrigated because of the presence of buildings that prevented the pivots and, and hand, the wheel lines from moving through. And luckily for me, there were some ground squirrels living on this area. And so I took it upon myself to study them for the next 26 years. And I still have questions that I haven't answered. I can assure you that no matter what you know about something, there's always more to study. So what was my approach to studying these animals? What I particularly wanted to do is track the individual lifetimes of, of given, given individuals. So when you see three animals like this, well, we can guess that they're probably brothers and sisters, part of a, a, a given family. But if you come back a few weeks later when they've molted from their baby coat into their juvenile coat and changed color, are these two, some of these animals? Or are they different animals? And if you come back even a few months later than that and find another animal here, well, is this one of the original three here or even one of these two? How do we go about keeping track of individual ground squirrels so that we can follow their lifetimes? Well, it involves having a variety of techniques and involving live trapping is the main one that I use, using these specialized traps that don't harm the animals. I then am interested in their condition, so weighing them, of course they change weight a lot because of fattening for hibernation and then coming out all skinny next year, uh, having depleted their fat stores, so keeping records of that. It's important to know what sex a given animal is, and here you have your chance to sex uh, Richardson's ground squirrel. Uh, I always like to do this when I have an audience that I can interact with, unlike the electronic audience that I'm dealing with now. But if you want, you could put down what you think the answer to this question is in your chat box and we'll see how many people get it right. This could be a male, it could be a female. If I ask this question of an audience, I typically find that about th a third of the audience thinks it's a female, about a third thinks that it's a male, and the other third just simply do not want to commit themselves. The answer in this particular case is that it's a male and it's the time of year when it's actually easiest to identify males because his testes are descended into a, a blackened scrotum here. That actually only lasts for about one month because there's only a short uh, breeding season for Richardson's ground squirrels. There's no point in males having active testes for the other 48 weeks of the year because there's nobody to inseminate and so the testes regress and return back up into the abdominal cavity. And it does become quite a bit harder to sex an animal, distinguish a male from a female. If any of you want to know how I do it, get in contact with me, ask the question later, and I'll tell you what to look for to tell. Then you need to be able to recognize a given animal throughout its lifetime. So the way that I identify an animal permanently is by putting tags in the ears. So we're looking down on the head of a ground squirrel. Here are the eyes, here, here are the ears. And these tags are just like earrings, basically. Uh, and they are permanent, they're permanently affixed to the ear. Uh, and they have a number on them. This particular animal is 5781. But the problem, of course, with the earrings, although they do provide lifetime identification, they can't be read from a distance. So you need a way to mark the animal for distance observation. And for that, I used Lady Clara Clairol dye. I uh, bought untold numbers of boxes of Clairol dye. Those of you who can see me in the thumbnail see that I do not have dark hair. I turned white at a very young age and I bought tons of hair dye that never went on my hair. 
it went onto the ground squirrels so that I could individually mark them. Sometimes I would have as many as 100 animals with individual die marks using arithmetic symbols. This is a symbol for therefore uh, or letters, single or multiple letters of the, of the alphabet or sometimes numerals or whatever I could think of so that I could distinguish an animal from a distance. Of course, these molt out a couple of times a year and you have to retrap the animal. You've got the animal uh, with its ear tag, so you can double check that you've got the correct animal and put the same die mark on. And that way you can build up a history of each animal. Uh, is it still active? Are you seeing it or not? Has it disappeared? Where might it be? How, does it, how do these animals interact with each other? So once you've got them individually marked, you can ask all sorts of questions about what goes on in the lives of these animals. And so that's what I proceeded to do for a number of years. And what I want to focus on particularly is basically what a year looks like in the life of a ground squirrel. And it turns out to be important to distinguish between males and females, and actually even over and above that between adults and juveniles. And so I want to continue by telling you how the year works out for a ground squirrel. RGS is my shorthand for Richardson's ground squirrel, just a little faster to say. Please note that this is a truncated scale here. I haven't put in November, December, January, February, because otherwise I would run out of space on my screen. So we're just looking at what the portions of the year where ground, ground squirrels will be seen above ground. So the very first animals that you see come out of hibernation could be late February, as I said, I saw some today, but more typically it's March. And, and the dates I'm using are for what I experience in the picture Picture Butte region could be slightly different near to the mountains, a little later certainly if you go north. Shortly after the males have appeared, the females appear above ground. So there's a period of time when those, you're only seeing adult males before the adult females appear, but typically about a two week uh, difference. As Soon as the females appear, we have the mating season. So mating occurs in the first few days and female typically mates on her third day out of hibernation. So there's just a very short window before she becomes pregnant. She's then pregnant, or gives birth, follows following that. She's lactating, producing milk for those offspring. And then there's quotes the rest of the active season. For the males, they come out of hibernation with their testes descended as I showed you in that photograph. But then once the mating season is over and it's going to be basically 48 weeks before uh, there'll be another female to mate with, the testes then regress and return into the male's body. Now, what I want you to particularly notice here is when the end of the active season occurs for the adults. Adult males on, in the picture butte area go back into hibernation in late June. In fact, many of them go into hibernation before the summer solstice. So I want to say that again, they're going into hibernation after four months of activity in late June. The females have a somewhat similar story, but it's all offset by several weeks, that difference between females come out a bit later. After they finish lactating, females recover from the stress of lactation and they fatten, and they are ready to go into hibernation in July. They're going to spend the rest of the year hibernating. You will not see them again until the next year. Uh, early or mid-March for the males, a little later, usually a couple of weeks later for the females. It turns out that the typical average season length or the typical season length for uh, adult Richardson's ground school in southern Alberta is 110 days. And this is based on 26 years of data and truly thousands of animals over those 26 years. Excuse me, I have to toss my cat off my lap here. Toss, there it goes. So the only difference is the timing of it, but the duration is about the same. So now let's think about the other members that we see. The juveniles are born underground, so we don't see them for that first month, month of life. So when the females lactating, the offspring are below ground, and we don't see them. Then the juveniles do some growth and some fattening, but they're ready to go into hibernation in late August. Their brothers, however, stay out and stay out and stay out and stay out, and they don't go into hibernation until October. So here we have again a sex difference. It was males before females here. Here it's females before males. So there's a big difference in how the young of the year, the juveniles, 
spending their time versus the older animals, the one-year-olds and the two-year-olds. So we had this very marked pattern. And just to emphasize it for you, well, for the juveniles, the male, the male juveniles are the ones that stay out the longest. They're out until into October. So that means months after their fathers have gone into hibernation, here's when the adult males, the sires of these juveniles have gone into hibernation. This is when the sons of those males finally hibernate. And so the last two months of, the, of, of activity, you see, is all young males born in that particular year. So what we have is a situation where we start off just with adult males, then a mixture of adult and males and females. Uh, we don't see the juveniles until they're ready to come above ground at a month old. Then we have adults and juveniles, but now we've hit the time when the adult males will go into hibernation and then the adult females will go into hibernation. So we're left with the male and female juveniles Finally, the little sisters go into hibernation, just leaving their brothers as the only active members that we see above ground. And then finally, we reach the point where everybody's hibernating. So this is a remarkable, truly remarkable calendar of events. There is no other species that has such an extreme variation between when part of the population starts to hibernate and another part of the population starts to hibernate. So there must be lots of lots of questions that we can ask about this uh, as to why these young males are staying out so late, uh, why there's not only a sex difference, but a reverse in that difference between the juveniles and the adults. Just a ton of questions to ask. So there's only one brief period when all the age and sex classes of brown squirrels are above ground. So the animals that you see in March are not the same animals that you're going to see in September and October. There are different individuals. But unless you can tell which individual is which, know its age and its sex, that's not apparent. And it took studies, uh, a number of years of study, to figure this out, that it really mattered. You had to know what age and what sex individuals were to know when you might see them above ground. So if we ask the question, well, then how much time does this mean they actually spend underground versus above ground? And using a calendar based on the way we would, if a ground squirrel drew this calendar, they would start it when it came out of hibernation here. But what we see here is that an animal, once it goes into hibernation, stays in hibernation for months and months and months and months. And if we tack the other bit on over here, we can go off screen over here somewhere. Uh, and uh, that's how long they hibernate for. During the active season, and they come above ground, they spend much of the day uh, above ground, but they sleep for a surprising chunk of time. So initially sleeping for about 16 hours a day, dropping that down to about 12 hours a day, finally to about 10 hours a day, and then sleeping for longer and longer periods, and then finally going into hibernation. So if you add up all the underground time hibernating and all the underground time sleeping, you discover that these animals are spending 85% of their life underground just in sleeping and hibernation. And that's the same for adult males and females, just slightly offset a bit in terms of when the dates would occur. The juveniles, of course, start a little later in the year uh, before they hibernate. So they, for them, it's a slightly smaller proportion of their life underground relative to their total uh, yearly, year, first year of life. So what goes on in these underground places? When they spend so much of their life underground, it seems like we should study them. In fact, when I first came from Australia and started working with ground squirrels, I thought, well, I'd been really smart to work with a species that hibernates. That way I don't have to go out and do field work in the winter. But after a few years of working with them, I realized I had to know something about what goes on underground and try and figure out how to study that. And there have been several approaches over the years, one of which is, well, just get out there and do the hard work and excavate a burrow system and see what you can figure out about what's underground and how they're using the space. So here's my husband taking a day off from farming so that he can help me. And here's my graduate student, Catherine, and we're starting a, a dig here. I'm usually the smallest person in the team. So if there's a tight corner, guess who gets sent down to figure out which way we should to uh, go next. 
So I've only ever actually, with, with various assistants, dug up one entire burrow system. It took about three weeks. It's not the sort of thing you do very often. And I need to orient you on this very strange looking photograph. Everything that's outlined in dotted green is original surface, looking a little damaged because of course we've been working on this now for several weeks. So this is original surface here. Everything other than that is underground. It's, we've removed the, the layers and layers going gradually down layer by layer to see what we would find. Uh, just to give you a scale, the yellow uh, marker here is a, a wooden uh, one meter stick. So that's one meter. So basically from here to here to the edges of what we excavated was about 10 meters and then not quite that far in width. So we all know about the holes that we see ground squirrels disappearing down. So what this gives us is an ability to trace what happens. Uh, this of course, the colors of course we provided so that to be able to distinguish the various sorts of tunnels, uh, we spray painted different things. So anything that came to the surface, we kept spraying with blue paint so that we could see where it would go. Then we would encounter tunnels that didn't come to the surface, but connected different things underground. So they were just tunnels that took the, the animals could take shortcuts or long cuts or whatever wandered to some other portion of the system. In addition, there were two sleeping chambers, spherical chambers that were lined with grass, which would be where the animal uh, would sleep. So you can learn a lot about the architecture of the underground space and how, how the complexity of the burrow systems and so forth. But of course, the big drawback is you basically only get one data point. It's a big, interesting data point, but you've destroyed the burrow system. I did, this was in, where the owner of this particular burrow system had been uh, predated by um, a hawk, so it was no longer available. So we didn't feel too bad about digging it up before somebody else would have taken it over. Another approach, which Catherine, the graduate student you saw uh, in that previous photograph did, is what I would call the whack-a-mole technique. We didn't actually use mallets and pump them, pump them on the head, but we we're trying to figure out the relationship between the places where this particular female was known to go underground when she was ready to go to bed or maybe in the mornings where she would come out. And so we would just, as soon as she came out, just uh, persuade her to go back underground and see where she pops up next and next and next and so forth as we go around, she comes back down here again, gets a brilliant idea about trying to get out there, goes up here, no, that's no good, we force her back underground, she tries this, she goes back underground here, she tries again, comes down to here, and finally she and we give up, uh, and we pretty much outlined the system uh, of interconnections. Of course, we can't tell how deep they are, and I forgot to mention on that, big dig that we did, the depth was between 50 and 100 centimeters, so up to a meter deep uh, at the deepest places. So we have some sense of the complexities. We can see how they change. If you come back in a few weeks later or a month or so later, you can check to see whether the connections are the same or whether they change. And the interesting thing that Catherine found is there's a lot of underground uh, activity going on. New tunnels get reopened, old ones get closed and reopened later. So it's very dynamic what they're doing underground. We can't see that going on, but we can learn by this sort of technique what's going on. Another technique that we have used is radio telemetry to actually locate an animal when they're underground uh, by creating a collar that goes around the animal's neck uh, that has an antenna uh, that gives out a signal that we can pick up on a receiver here. And so you uh, put this around the neck of the animal uh, and it uh, enables you to locate the animals uh, when they're underground, for which you need an antenna connected to that receiver there. And so here I am locating uh, a, a, what would be a sleep site for a particular animal. Uh, but remember that since uh, the adults go into hibernation in June and July, in fact, it's quite likely to be perfectly green and nice when you're tracking animals that are actually in hibernation. To get a full record means going year round. And since I'm the person who lives on the study site, guess who gets to do the winter work in the tough time? So here I am again out in my L grid here, which you can see part of here, uh, relocating this animal and determining is it in torpor? Is it active? Is it dead? Is it still there? 
and we're getting quite a lot of information because the little transmitter in the unit is temperature sensitive so it reports the body temperature of the animal and so what i build up then is a record of the body temperature of these animals these are actually animals the arrow indicates when it's actually gone into hibernation and it's going to stay in this one place and as you can see they have a rather complex temperature pattern through the winter but it corresponds with the adults going for adult males first, adult females a bit later, the juvenile females, and finally the young males going into hibernation. So you get a lot of data from uh, these uh, transmitters reporting temperature. So I talked a little bit about the, uh, the hibernation. Obviously, we're all aware that they sleep underground, but I want to focus on a few other things that they do underground related to reproduction and then some other things that they do depending on the day, uh, vary from day to day. This is an unusual photograph because it turns out the ground squirrels usually mate underground. It's relatively rare to see them copulating above ground. It's a little dangerous for them because they are so enamored with each other, they lose track of predators and things like that. Usually the female will only let the male mount her if she's gone underground. Um, so mostly the uh, conception occurs underground. The litter is then born underground after a 23-day pregnancy. And we don't usually see young when they're, when they're tiny, but for some reason, this mother decided that she needed to move her litter when it was about five days old. And so that's the youngest I've ever actually seen a baby in the wild. If you want to study them in more detail, you have to bring a pregnant female in and have her give birth in captivity. And these are newborn babies. They weigh about six or seven grams. Uh, you can see where their eyes will develop. You can get an idea that their ears will develop. Uh, the toes and the back feet are still joined together. They're basically big mouths to suck milk. That's about all they're designed for when they're born. Usually five to seven infants in a litter. So this was an unusually small litter to, to just have four individuals. So these ones are about 10 days old. They're starting to get a little fur on them, but still mostly you see that very pink skin. By the time they're 20 days old, they look extremely cute. Of course, we never see them at this age in the wild. They now can hold their heads up. You can see where the eyes will, the eyelids will eventually separate, but the eyes are still closed at this point. So they can hold themselves up on uh, the front, but they can't get their back legs underneath them yet. So they can't walk and they so they just, well, they've got nowhere to walk at this age. Mother comes to them, they don't really need to go anywhere. Their eyes open when they're about 22 to 23 days old. So this nest of young would be about 25 days at this stage. So throughout all of this, the mother comes and visits several times during the day to suckle the young and she sleeps with the litter um, overnight. And this goes on for four weeks. The litter is entirely dependent on the mother's milk. They stay entirely underground. So even though their eyes have opened when they're 22 days old, they still don't see anything because they're in the total darkness of an underground chamber. So uh, as yet, these animals haven't seen what the real world is like out there. Usually the mother will move her litter once during, the, during lact lactation typically within the same burrow system, but here again was an unusual situation where this mother decided to go to a new burrow system. And the only way she could do that is carrying her young and they can only take one at a time. And these were pretty big young. She was basically tripping over her kids as she went back and forth to get the next one. And eventually then the young reach the age where they come above ground and start to become independent, find their own spaces, etc. Grow, fatten, and get ready to hibernate. So, one obvious question to ask is how many sleep sites are there uh, used in an active season? Uh, the the one big dig that we did there were, was early in the season, and there were two sleep sites. But if that animal had not been predated and had lived for the rest of the season, would she have used more sites? Well, we can answer that question by going to other animals that were lucky enough to live for several years. And so what this is showing you is we just call the first place this female was in when she came out of hibernation, her first sleep site. She spent about five or six days there and on about the third day she mated. So the M indicates she mated. So now she's pregnant 
And during pregnancy, she actually switched several times to another site and another site and another site. And finally, parturition giving birth occurred. So she had actually slept in one, two, three, four places before she gave birth. Uh, stayed in that place for quite a fair while. For some reason, she moved the litter for about a week and then she decided, nope, the first place was good enough and she brought them back to there. So during lactation, this particular female used two sites, but it ended up being three different bouts of the two sites. Then the litter came above ground and it's post-lactation. She doesn't have to worry about producing milk anymore. And she pretty much stayed in one place. She liked the place that she'd chosen over here and went back to that. And then a really interesting pattern that comes up is what happens during the final stages of the active season. And they go into a pattern of switching back and forth, uh, spending one, two, three or four nights in different places. So she was staying in one, two, three, four, five, going back and forth between five different sleep sites, never spending really long periods in any one. And then finally, she picks where she's going to hibernate. And it's not a place she's ever been seen in before. She's never slept in that particular location. So she slept in seven different sites. And the eighth site was the site that was her hibernaculum. And that's a pretty typical pattern. I've done this for a lot of animals and just summarizing a whole lot of data for you here. Active season, 110 days for the adults. Usually used somewhere seven, eight, nine. The average turns out to be eight sleep sites. And with that switching back and forth, we can break that into 22 bouts. And we can count how many are used at different times uh, in the season. And then we get the rest of the year. Re the year doesn't necessarily have to turn out to be 365 days. Sometimes it does. It depends whether we have an early spring or a late autumn or something like that. But no matter what the exact duration of hibernation is, they always only have one site and they spend the entirety of hibernation in that one location. So month after month after month. That first female's record we looked at, I actually had her lifetime record for all the places that she slept in. So you can see overall patterns that repeat every time. Every time she got pregnant, she would always have slept in what the birthing chamber ahead of time. So she, she always starts sleeping in where she's chosen to give birth ahead of time. Some sharing space because sleep sites does occur with kin like mothers, sisters, aunts and nieces. But that never happens during the lactation period. It always happens either in early pregnancy or post lactation. But there is some sharing of sleep sites. What is never shared and never used even in advance is the hibernaculum. No matter how long the season, what the dates are, whether she didn't get pregnant or she does get pregnant and weans a litter, always the place that the animal goes into to hibernate is a new place prepared ahead of time, but never used. And always they hibernate alone. There's never sharing of space for hibernation. So by collecting repeated years of data, you start to see the basic patterns that are going on with these animals. Just to comment on this interesting pattern of temperature, of body temperature of the animals in hibernation, um, usually they're, they stay cold. Their body temperature drops to whatever soil temperatures. So this is tracking the change in soil temperature. And, and I, I, of course, have a separate record of the soil temperature. So most of the time their body is cold. Here's uh, the temperature of the body being reported by the radio uh, transmitter. But every so often they briefly warm up and then cool back down again for another talk about. And after a week or 10 days or increasing periods, you can see these get longer and longer gaps here. And finally, towards the end of winter, body temperature gets very close to zero degrees centigrade. These animals are getting close to freezing point. Freezing point would be about minus two for their bodies because they're basically a salt solution. Well, obviously being that cold means that they're not going to react. Even, even if their body temperature is 15 or 20 degrees centigrade, they cannot react. So here's an animal in a talk about uh, and curled up the way they always, uh, the posture they always get into to hibernate completely unreactive. It would take about three hours for this animal to warm up to a temperature at which it could start to move, start to bite, 
to actually be alive. In other words, these animals are extremely vulnerable when they're in hibernation. They can't protect themselves. They can't run away because it takes hours for them to warm up from the, the torpid cold temperature. So we can think about then what sh how should they organize their hibernation? What risks are there in the world that they have to contend with? And so we've looked at this by digging up some hibernaculum systems after the animals have finished hibernating. Or well, in this case, this particular animal died late in hibernation, probably just a few weeks before she would have come uh, above ground. Of natural causes, we never knew quite what it was. We pulled some of the grass away so that you can see it, but she was completely enclosed in a thick grassy nest inside this chamber, which we refer to as the hibernaculum, so in a space like that. The hibernaculum always has only one exit, one a hole on one, one place, and that connects to a tunnel that works its way up towards ground level, but doesn't actually open to ground level. And coming off that, there's always what I refer to as a drainage tunnel, a tunnel that goes down, it's blind ending, but it's positioned in such a way that any water that trickles in would drain down that way. And it's blind ending there. And then this is blind ending here, it's plugged, it has to be opened before the animal can escape. So this is a closed system. There's no way in or out. In fact, the only way out is that the animal, if it survives to the end of hibernation, has to dig its way out, like basically digging a little chimney that gets it up to the surface. And this will appear as just a tiny little hole, no soil around it because it's been opened from below. So the soil is brought down and the animal appears and it's a very tiny hole, often very hard to find. So they have this special system in which nothing can get in and out except for one thing, and that's badgers. Badgers are, of course, designed as expert excavators. And badgers, if you have a resident badger in the, popul in the population, uh, they will easily kill two thirds of the hibernating ground squirrels. Badgers are just excel at finding hibernating animals. If they start to dig and they get onto this tunnel here, they, all they have to do is follow it and there's the, there's the ground squirrel. So why do the ground squirrels never sleep in the hibernaculum ahead of time? Well, I would say one of the things they don't want to do is label it with too much odor, anything that would give an advantage to the badger to find them. So although they would dig it and prepare it weeks in advance, they, they stay away from it and leave it as clean and pristine as possible until they actually seal themselves into the hibernation system. So, mostly I focused on being in hibernation or being in a sleep site, but there are things that go on just during the daytime. They do go down underground to nap, for instance. So you see animals disappearing for a while and reappearing. Uh, they avoid inclement weather. Really hot weather is not good for them. They need to cool off by going underground. They really detest rain. They hate getting wet from rain. They don't mind snow so much, but they really hate rain. They can avoid all the aerial predators by going underground, and they can avoid some of the terrestrial predators by slipping underground, but not all of them. This is not a complete gallery of the predators of Richardson's ground squirrels, but certainly the most important ones. The ones that have the biggest impact on the population are Swainson's hawk, hawks, especially if they have a nest of uh, chicks that they're feeding, uh, catch several a day. And then the badger is the other one, most especially before it can, because it can get the animals in hibernation. Long-tailed weasels are very good at going underground, but they don't dig. So they can corner adults, adult ground squirrels underground and kill them, or they can find a nest and eat the infants, but they cannot get into the hibernaculum because weasels don't dig. Uh, rattlesnakes, two rattlesnakes here, here are the heads of those two rattlesnakes. Uh, they certainly uh, eat a, a certain number of ground squirrels, mostly the juveniles. Their venom is so mild it doesn't seem to have much impact on the adult ground squirrels, but they can catch juvenile ground squirrels. Uh, coyotes can do some digging, but not enough that they can get animals that have gone well into their burrow system. So they really depend on catching them above ground. And the owl is an interesting one. The owls tend to be a predator just in the mating season, because for reasons I've never fully understand, the ground squirrels mate quite late in the day, just about sunset, 
just at the time the owls are beginning their active period. So owls do take a certain number of brown squirrels, but just in the early spring. So going back to this calendar of events and looking at all the extreme differences we have here based on sex and so forth, I just want to touch on one related topic of many that I could about how the, that calendar is related to other things in the lives of these animals. And that is, here is the weight trajectory. The weight's a repetitive capture of animals. Males come out of, males are much larger than females. They almost double the mass of females when they come out of hibernation. They lose weight during the mating season. I'll come back to that momentarily. And then they gain weight and fatten and go into hibernation. They're always heavier than the females. The males are always heavier than the females. For the juveniles, they're pretty much the same weight when they wean, but pretty soon the young males get ahead of their sisters. And remember, they're staying out later and later and later until October. So they get to be basically the same size as their fathers were when they went into hibernation. So we have this extreme pattern where the young males get to full size, but the young females don't get to full size. They will have to finish their growth when they come out of hibernation uh, at this stage here. Now, whenever you see that males are much bigger than females, it immediately makes you think, aha, there's probably male-male competition. And what is that competition most likely going to be for? Well, for finding females who are willing to mate. So here we have a young female. She's a yearling. This is her first mating season. She's not quite a year old. She's never encountered a male who wants, who's interested in her before. And she's giving a very strong, um, I don't want you near me message here. What he wants to do is slip his nose under her belly and sniff her genital region to see if she's in estrus or not. But behaviorally, she's giving off the sign of not yet dear, come back later. And certainly a couple of days later, go back. She's now come into behavioral estrus. She's willing to mate instead of attacking the male or trying to drive him away. She will slip down into the tunnel here. He'll follow and they'll mate uh, underground. But of course, there's other males in the population also trying to find the females who are in behavioral estrus. And they get into big fights with each other. They do a lot of damage to each other. They literally draw blood. Sometimes the damage is extreme, really bad wounds on the face very often. Uh, some of them get badly infected, toe broken here on this particular animal. A lot of a very aggressive fighting for males trying to get position uh, to find their females who are going to mate today. Uh, there'll be a different ones to search for tomorrow. And some of these males die in the process, working so hard at uh, trying to locate you know, estrus females and driving the other males away. Males who make it to the end of the mating season have a lot of recovering to do, but they've got a couple of months to do that in. And here's a male who's sort of a butterball now. He's a real fat specimen. Uh, and he is ready to go into hibernation. And maybe we will be lucky enough to survive to a second mating season. So just to sort of summarize some of these male-female differences and how they relate to the, the, the year and the life of these animals, is females make a big effort in rearing young. They don't get receive any help from the fathers of these uh, offspring. She can only produce one litter a year. That's the absolute maximum, typically six young in an average. And statistically speaking, based again on years of data, the average female will produce one and a half litters a year. Now, of course, that's a statistic. What it means is many females only have one litter. Quite a few have two litters. A rare female will produce three or four litters in a lifetime. Males have a different sort of story to tell. Their effort goes into mating getting into fights, they result in being uh, injured from that, they lose weight, they often die. But a successful male who can uh, get the interest of a number of females could sire offspring in as many as seven or eight litters if he's really lucky, or maybe only one or two litters. But remember that it's very rare for a male to even experience two breeding seasons, and he makes no effort as a parent. All, of, all the work rearing the offspring is for the females. So I want to wind things up at this point uh, and encourage you to remember that these animals are Richardson's ground squirrels. Alternate using that name along with gopher if you also like that name. Uh, but they are truly squirrels that live on the ground. Very interesting animals have an extremely interesting schedule of activity. 
Uh, I'm happy to take questions. We'll certainly do that. But if you think of a question and want to ask me later, there's my email address. Feel free to contact me by email. Uh, or I have a lot of information about Richardson's Ground Schools on this website, so feel free to go to that. Uh, I just want to acknowledge the University of Lethbridge and the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council for having supported my research. And thanks very much to Sam and, and Jane and to the Pinch Creek Municipal Library in Chinook Arch uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk about, say it with me, Richardson's Ground Squirrels. Yay! Thank you, Sam. I'll turn it back over to you. Hello. Well, thank you, Gail. That was, I definitely learned a lot more than I did know <laughs> about these. Are really, I've always found them to be really cute animals. I've always thought they were way misunderstood. And um, I'm glad that you you proved that in your, in your presentation and it was very enjoyable. I will um, leave it over to you guys if you have any more questions. And I see there's one here. Um, they ask, are RGS using tunnels dug by other RSG? Are mm -hmm. they territorial regarding tunnels? Well, a given animal has a, a burrow system that, that it treats as its own, uh, and it will certainly chase out uh, other, especially other squirrels that are not its genetic kin. Uh, females uh, maintain very strong social ties with their genetic kin. So with their mother and grandmother, daughters, granddaughters, depending on age, which way we, we're, we're going in the uh, genealogy, uh, with sisters, particularly their littermate sisters, the ones that they shared, and then they'll have older or younger sisters born in a different year, so half sisters. Uh, and they're very tolerant of sharing space with their close genetic kin, uh, except during late pregnancy and lactation. And at that point, every female strictly uh, keeps uh, a portion of her burrow system to herself uh, and will not share it with the others. But after the young have started to come above ground and are, are active again uh, and are not totally dependent on the mother for milk, then they'll allow close kin to come in. But they're intolerant of distant kin and individuals who are so distantly kin that we don't have any idea what relationship they are. Burrow systems are, of course, extremely valuable. It takes an enormous amount of work to build something, as we saw that big dig that we did. That would represent probably two or three years of, of work by probably possibly several individuals extending portions of tunnels. Uh, and so they're so valuable that they are almost immediately taken over uh, if, if the animal dies. So if an animal dies, predation, whatever the cause may be. One of the quickest ways I would discover that an animal was missing would be by noticing a stranger using a given burrow system, saying, what's that animal doing over there? Search around for what I think is the rightful owner of that burrow system, and sure enough, she can't be found or he can't be found. And the ground squirrels themselves are extremely uh, cognizant of what burrow systems are in use uh, and they will take over a system. They're, there's not, not in the sense of fight over, but in the sense of if one is abandoned for whatever reason, loss of the animal, or the animal's found another place to go, leaving its place vacant, it will be taken over. It's such a valuable resource that none of those burrow systems go to waste. Uh, they continue to exist for year after year, get renovated, moder modernized, if you like, uh, new, new sleep sites, freshly lined with new grass and so forth. It's very dynamic. It's not apparent unless you figure out these ways to collect data on what's going under underground. We had no idea it was so dynamic what they were doing with underground space. Yeah, their, their tunneling systems are very intricate, way more intricate than I thought they would be. That's for sure. Does the dying of the animals' fur make them 
more likely to be targeted by predators? Does it impact their camouflage? Right. Well, that's a question I was, that, that's very worthy of being asked and certainly I was very concerned about because that would, you know, invalidate a lot of what I'm trying to do if it turns out I'm attracting predators uh, by die marking animals. I never found any evidence of that and, and in the indirect way that you get at that is sometimes I had, I didn't need to have all the animals die marked at, the, at a given time. If I had a sufficient number die marked for a particular study uh, and I would be able to watch uh, what the predators did and it didn't seem like there was any evidence that say Swainson's hawk would be more likely to pick a die marked animal than a non die marked animal. Some of the predators it would make no difference at all, I think. Things like the weasels, the badger, etc., that where a lot of their predation is done underground, they don't even see, they're, they're depending on smell for, for what they're doing. So the die mark uh, would not make uh, any impact on that. Uh, I certainly never saw any evidence that it was uh, causing increased predation. Uh, but it's certainly something that I worried about and, and looked for, but never found anything that caused concern. Okay, that was a good question. Okay, here's another one. Has anyone tried using ground penetrating radar to do 3D mapping of the underground space? I don't know of anyone who has done that. Um, I know it. it Somebody had suggested that to me uh, when I was doing that big dig. Well, you know, why not use remote technology to do that? I haven't run into any publications that have used that technique. I don't know why that would be. Um, so, I, you know, it's, a, it's certainly a good suggestion. And if somebody finds out that some examples of that, I'd, I'd be pleased to know about it. But I don't, none of my colleagues uh, who've worked on Richardson's or any of the other species of ground squirrels have used that technique that I'm aware of. Hmm. Okay, and then one more. At what age does it, do the young males no longer accept their brothers as friends? Uh, <laughs> well, I, I think it's only connected with the, with the actual mating season. Um, so, well, I should step back a bit and say that males, as, as in many mammals, males are the dispersing sex. In other words, males are the ones who leave home and, and females, the daughters, tend to stay near where they were born and settle down so that you get a, a matrilineal system going of, of females uh, who are related to each other. Males have gone elsewhere. And of course, one of the outcomes of that is that it, uh, reduces the probability of inbreeding. So males have moved away somewhere else. So the likelihood that a couple of males would even end up being close to each other later in life is already pretty low. Um, but I have had instances where there would be brothers uh, that were uh, present. Uh, they would, in the mating season itself, and the mating season is fairly short, almost all the females get mated in a period of about 15 days or so sometimes a little longer, three weeks, depending on how the weather goes and so forth. And under those circumstances, uh, brothers would be intolerant of each other in the sense of they're competing for something, competing for access to a female. Uh, but after the mating season is over, um, there's no reason for them to be competitive and, and they are not. In fact, males become real wimps after the mating season, to be quite honest. They're very low profile. They're just recovering from the stresses of the mating season trying to eat as much as they can to put on the, the mass so that they can go into hibernation at the end of June. Yeah, so it takes a lot out of them. <laughs> um, you know, the mating season certainly does. And you know, people should be on the lookout for that. As I've said, there are some male ground squirrels above ground right now, uh, too early for females to appear, but you know, by mid-March or so, very likely they will be. Keep an eye open and if you start to see males that are animals that are looking battered up, if they've got you know, wounds and so forth, you'll know that the mating season is going on and those are males. You never see a female with wounds. The females, uh, even if they uh, get into a fight with a, a non-kin female, they never do any serious damage to each other. 
The males, as you can see, literally rip each other apart. They, they try and do as much damage as they, as they can. Crazy. Well, that's very interesting. Um, the same person who asked about the um, ground penetrating radar has said that they use it a lot in archaeologic archaeologically um, investigations in many places. So they use the radar in like right. archaeological digs and such. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a perfect. I mean, it's an excellent technique. Yeah, uh, if you have the opportunity to use it, and and yeah, it would be interesting for sure. Well, and if it if it gave you the level of resolution, the the tunnels are not very big in diameter. Maybe, gosh, let me think about it. Maybe five centimeters or something like that. Oh uh, and they they are uh, it's small in diameter. Um, the total amount of actual tunnel space in a system is really fairly small relative to the total amount of soil that surrounds them. Uh, and they are constantly being changed. We can tell from the way females, particular females, what we've studied, you, which holes they use to get to a particular sleep site. We can tell that there have been changes going on underground. And it would be really useful to have something that you could go out maybe you know, once every week or two weeks or something and see you know, has this has this tunnel been blocked off or has a new spur been built on a particular tunnel? So I'm sure that if it were an easy and appropriate technique to use, somebody will be figuring it out as we speak. Yeah. Okay, another question just came. Are they car carnivorous? Not in the sense that they kill to eat, no. But if they find free protein lying around in the form of a, uh, a roadkill, for instance, then yes, they will, but they do not kill for food. Uh, well, they might accidentally eat a gra grasshopper or something like that, but they certainly wouldn't kill. Uh, they don't kill mice or voles or other animals. That would be very abnormal to see. Uh, so they're not, they're, they're basically vegetarians. They would take a few insects uh, like grasshoppers, but that's it. So they're more foragers, kind of. Strictly. Oh, yeah, that's what they're doing, coming above ground and, and eating, eating forage, yeah. So it's pretty much, you know, a, a, diet, of, a, a diet of vegetation is essentially what they're after, and seeds. Um, so certainly they will steal grain from around the grain bins. We know that from my husband's uh, grain operation. Yeah. That, uh, if, if there's a spill of grain when you're loading or unloading a truck or something like that, ground squirrels will be right there. And one of the interesting, one interesting sex difference that I haven't mentioned uh, is that male ground squirrels do actually stash some uh, seeds in the hibernaculum. Females never do. Females only just have the grass for the nest. Males have grass for a nest and under the grassy nest, if they've been able to find a source of seeds, um, they store seeds. And well, I'll give you the, the short version of this. The, the, the importance of that for males is that they have to regrow their testes every year. Remember I said that the testes uh, are only descended for about four weeks and then they uh, regress in size and move back up uh, the inguinal canal into the body cavity. Well, that means that has to all be reversed next spring so that they have uh, sperm producing testes by the time the females appear. And males depend on uh, a stash of food, of seed, to be able to uh, break, break uh, torpor, but stay underground and eat seed and start growing their testes so that when they actually come above ground, when they finally emerge above ground, um, they are already testicular. Um, and, and ready to mate if they should be lucky enough to find a female that quickly. Oh, interesting. Um, are there any more questions from our listeners? That was the last one type. Let's wait a few minutes. Well, certainly if people think of questions as they, as they go along, I mean, one, one thing I haven't talked about is what is 
the mortality rate like in these uh, squirrels, uh, it turns out to be very high. Uh, again, in fact, I think I have, a, I've got a few extra slides that, yeah, probability of surviving to the next year. I'll answer this question, even though nobody asked it. <laughs> so in fact, of the young males that are born, and this, this is based on over 8,000 juveniles that I have followed in the 26 year period, on average in a given year, it varies from year to year, but on average over all these years, only slightly over 10% of young males survive and recruit into the population. In other words, can be found somewhere within a few hundred meters uh, of, of where they started. Uh, only about a quarter of the males, so that about a little over 10% survive to become one-year-olds. Oh. About a quarter of those survive to become two-year-olds. About a quarter of them survive again. I've only ever had one male make it to four years of age. So the mortality is very, and this is all natural mortality. This is just the mortality that results from various predators, just natural bodily strength and so forth. Uh, if we look at the females, uh, it's very, it's different, but the same general pattern. A little over, about a third of females, young females make it to the yearling year, so reach adulthood, about one third reach adulthood. And then about half of those will make it to being two years old, another half, three years old, and so forth. So that the very rare case there will be an animal, a female that will make it to six years of age. But you can see a marked difference between survival between males and females. And this is not just simply because males go off and disperse because there are some incomers as well that would offset that. Um, but they live a much riskier lifestyle. And so there's very high, high loss. Remember that all predation at the beginning of, uh, of the active season falls on males because they're the first ones out of hibernation. And all predation at the end of the active season falls on juvenile males because they are the only ones who are still above ground for two months. They're the only ready, ready food available. All the rest, the young females and the adult males and females are in hibernation. Um, so there are periods of time when males are the only choice for predators to take. And so that adds into the extreme uh, differential mortality between males and females. Interesting. Um. I have a question. Yes, Sam, go ahead. Um, is there any, because growing up in Southern Alberta, you know how farms, how farmers generally view ground squirrel, squirrels um, causing issues in their fields and whatnot. Has there been any technique um, as to how to deal with this humanely at all, like, or? Well, um, you know, things that people try is to, and to encourage predators, for instance, but, you know, there are complications with that. Less so with the aerial predators, things like prairie falcons and um, Swainson's hawks, for instance. You know, if you can encourage them to, to nest near where there's a population of ground schools, they will make use of, of that certainly uh, the, both the, the falcons and the Swainson's hawks are very effective predators. Uh, badgers are the most effective. I mean, badgers really t make a, a huge difference uh, to the population. No, they're not necessarily badgers present every year because they're so successful that they knock the population density down and reach the point that they have to leave and find another population. But I've discovered they come back every few years as soon as the ground squirrels build up. But a lot of people in the agricultural industry are not very tolerant of badgers because yeah. the badger digs are much more huge compared to the digs that the ground squirrels make. So it's, although the badgers are doing farmers a favor by killing off ground squirrels, they create a different problem by leaving big mounds of soil that the sure. equipment can, can run into. So, you know, it, it's, it's trading off one thing uh, against another. Mm -hmm. I guess, hey, that would be a very hard thing to, to weigh the pros and cons for, hey? Well, yes, and, and of course, you know, a lot of people, a lot of landowners uh, have a zero tolerance approach. Uh, and it's, 
you know, it's difficult to go out and assess what impact are the ground squirrels actually having on the crop, for instance. Uh, are, are they eating an amount that is tolerable to accept against the cost of uh, trying to get rid of them? Of course, there's expense in time and money to try and control animals. So uh, again, it's it's a trade-off. There's so many trade-offs that are, are involved here. You know, can you be tolerant? How many can you be tolerant of that aren't costing uh, the landowner uh, in terms of income, for instance? Not, they're not easy questions to answer. If they were easy, if there were easy answers, they would have been found by now. Yeah. Uh, and you know, my role in all of this is trying to help people understand what's going on so that if they're going to use control measures that they do it at an appropriate and meaningful time of year well, or have, have some effect. Uh, that uh, works to their benefit. So having the basic knowledge about these animals is important. And I was surprised when I came from Australia how little of that was available. For instance, people didn't know exactly when the ground squirrels made it. Did they mate before they went into hibernation or when they came out? Uh, how long did pregnancy last? There were two estimates at the time that I began working with them. One was 17 days and one was 32 days. Well, they couldn't both be correct, and it turned out neither of them was correct <laughs> because it's tricky to figure out how long pregnancy lasts. You have to figure out when the animal's mated and when she's given birth, and both of those things occur underground. Mm. So unless you've got marked animals and you do a lot of very careful observations, you can't figure out when mating's happened or birth has happened. And so it took me several years of working on techniques that I could exactly pinpoint when a female was impregnated and when she'd given birth to figure out that pregnancy lasted 23 days. Um, and I was surprised. Canadians didn't know that when I came from Australia, for instance. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, well, how many litters do they have per year? You know, you run into some landowners and say, oh, they're, they're like rabbits, they can have several litters a year. That's not true. There's an absolute limit. They can only have one litter a year. Even if the female loses the pregnancy or loses her young after they're born, she cannot replace the litter in the same year. She's got to survive to another year to have a separate attempt, attempt in a future year. Interesting. These little guys are so, they're more um, complicated and complex than I ever thought they were. <laughs> <laughs> Almost everything in the world is. Yeah. And certainly, it's certainly this huge difference between who is active when. There's no way that that can be figured out unless you have marked animals of known age and sex and you go out looking for them day after day after day to figure out, oh, the adult males go into hibernation that early. It's really true. And then, you know, confirming that by using the radio telemetry to show that they really are underground, they really are in cold torpor with their body temperatures dropping to 20 degrees, 15 degrees, five, finally down to almost zero degrees as the, as the season progresses. Uh, there's no way to learn that just casually. You have to put devoted effort into trying to find ways to identify these events as they occur. And thank goodness for modern technology that we can use like the radio transmitters uh, that report the temperature of the animal. That's an, Im an important technique to be able to use. Well, the devotion to your work is a very apparent. You must, I can't even imagine how many hours of time <laughs> you've, you've spent observing these little creatures. And, it's really amazing. <laughs> well, when I was doing the, the sleep site work, figuring out when the animals, where, where the animals are sleeping, uh, that meant waiting until they'd gone to bed. So collecting the, the first data point, in other words, where they, where they start the, the night, uh, I would have to wait until after sunset to go out and do that and then be up before dawn to relocate them again to discover, did they spend the whole night in the same place? or did they change sites? Turns out they almost always spend the entire night in the same sleep site. It's not very often that they you know, roll out of bed and find a different nest to go to in the same night. But all of that involved, uh, well, you know, sun up, sun, <laughs> sun down type work. But yeah. it's so interesting. It's so interesting to learn these things. And so that's what keeps you going and knowing that 
you learn one thing and that will raise another five questions that you now want to go out and answer. That's what research is all about. It's finding interesting things that nobody else has, has discovered and that you can pursue to, to learn more and more things about them. So I've had a great time over those 26 years learning about these animals. Well, I am very thankful for people like you who are so dedicated to find the answers to well, thank you. the world's <laughs> questions. <laughs> um, it looks like that people are slowly starting to leave and okay. there hasn't been any more questions. So okay. well, um, I'm glad I've been able to answer some. And as, uh, as I said, that uh, if people want to email me, if they think if they wake up in the middle of the night and think of something they really need to know about Richardson's ground squirrels, you can say, I won't answer it in the middle of the night, but you can send me the email and I'll answer it later. Yeah. Okay. So thank you for the opportunity. You're welcome. And thank you for being here. And thank you to everyone who came to watch Gail's presentation. And I will no longer be using the term gopher. <laughs> I will be forever using ground squirrels oh, now. Okay, 10 out of 10 to you. <laughs> Lovely. Richardson and will appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. And thank you. Oh, there is one comment. Um, just, I think it's just a thank you comment. Actually. Well, thank you to all the people who participated and listened. Uh, I wish that I could see who was out there participating. It's very odd to give a talk where you don't know where, who's in your audience. So I appreciate everybody who signed in and attended. Thanks very much.